again, uh, this is the fourth day in a row that you've seen us for virtual events. I'm Cindy Oser of Hobby Memorial Library, and today I have Lee Green Thaner, who is from our marketing, and I have a Dr. Leanne Temple, who has crossed the highway from Fort Hood. Uh, well, she's physically not done it. She's still over there on the other side of the highway um, for our virtual event. Before we get started, um, I want to remind you that if you uh, need credit for watching this, we're going to be putting in the comments uh, the little Google form that you can go to to register for this. We This whole week, we've been doing Women's History Month, and now we have the, the expert on women's history and oh. she was worried yes yeah, she was worried that she was going to give us too much information no <laughs> this was going to be great so i'm going to go ahead and let her get started and yes give your shout out to your mommy <laughs> <laughs> hey, <Mom. laughs> so hello everybody i'm dr temple i'm a professor of government here on the fort Hood campus if you haven't been by to visit us or taking classes on this side of the highway come come on come join us lots of fabulous instructors over here and we'd love to have you um so just kind of a little bit of background about myself how did i get here uh, first i'm an army wife so my husband of course brought me to the wonderful the great place of fort hood right um I started my journey, believe it or not, like a million moons ago here at Central Texas College. Uh, I wish I would have had it out. I could have shown you. But um, when we moved here, and I won't tell you what year because that'll date me. But when we moved here, I kept driving past this building that said Central Texas College. And I'm like, well, what is that about? Let me go check it out. So I came in, saw a registrar and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to go back and finish my degree that I had put on pause to become a mom. So I came in, did all my advising, got my degree plan and off I went. I probably took like 120 something credits here at CTC on the main campus though. I didn't come here to Fort Hood. Um, so I took all my classes over there and um, I loved it. It was awesome. And never in a million years could I have ever dreamed that I would be back here teaching at the very college that I started back at. So, um, you know, long story short, in the middle of all of those hundreds of credits that I was having so much fun taking, we moved. Um, my husband got picked up for recruiting, so we moved to the Dallas area. I finished my bachelor's at Texas A&M University Commerce and Political Science. Um, what led me to that degree, though, was all the work I had done at Fort Hood. So I was a volunteer as an Army wife. I didn't work, had a daughter in school, um, so I did family readiness group, but he was always an FRG leader. Um, I volunteered teaching the AFTB classes, um, AFAP conferences, you name it. If there was something going on in Fort Hood, I was likely volunteering for it, and I loved every bit of it. So when we get to um, Dallas, you know, my husband says, you really need to get a volunteer job that pays. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? That's not fun. Who wants to do that? Um, I was having the time of my life helping other people. So when it came time to really think about what I wanted to do. I had originally started at CTC thinking I wanted to be a teacher, um, you know, K-12 teacher. And then I said, you know, I really want to work with people. I want that public outreach. I want to have that connection with the community. And so political science kind of found my heart. I think it was always there. Um, it's you know, something I've been passionate about, I think, all my life with the government and politics. So I finished my bachelor's in political science. Um, I had a great mentor there, a woman, um, super short lady, about five foot tall, probably shorter than that. But I tell you what, um, she was probably stronger and bolder than any man on the campus. And she said, you need to come back and get your master's. So off I went to get my master's in political science. Um, she threw me in the classroom. I didn't know that was part of the deal. She said, you know, 18 credit hours, you're going to teach, young woman. So here I am, you know, teaching at a university thinking, what am I doing here? And then I fell in love with it. It was absolutely absolutely amazing. Um, and she said, you need to go get your doctorate. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's put a pause on that. So I finished my master's right about the time um, that my husband was being PCS back to Fort Hood, the great place, right? It's the black hole. Once you get here, you never leave. When you do, you come back. So I came back and had just finished my master's. I was teaching online for AM Commerce. And wouldn't you know, 
there was a government job available right here at CTC Fort Hood. So at the time, um, Dr. Aidy, who is now our deputy chancellor, was the dean. Um, I interviewed with her. Um, another you know, super strong, powerful woman. You could just tell right from the get-go. She was somebody that I wanted to work for. Um, and she gave me the opportunity, and I've been here ever since. And so now I'm a full-time um, professor over here teaching government and treading our way through the pandemic. I'm missing the classroom a whole lot, but here I am. Um, in the midst of that, and then later on, I said, you know what, that woman that was uh, had so much faith in me told me I needed to get my doctorate, and I did. Uh, but this time, I said, I need to do it in something that I want to be passionate about. And where the classroom is where I love educating people and mentoring people, I knew that someday I was going to have to give up the classroom and move over to administration. So I pursued a doctorate in higher education administration at UMHB right down the road, and here I am today, Dr. T, that's what everybody calls me in the classroom, okay? So, I um, have a lot of powerful women in my corner from my family, uh, my mom, she's watching today, I think, I hope. Hi, mommy, uh, raising a strong, powerful daughter, young woman who I hope goes out and, you know, just channels her own way. My sister, my aunt, I mean, just so many women who have always um, been in my corner and for each other. We build each other up and we just say, you know, you can do it just because you're a woman. There's nothing holding you back. The sky is not the limit. If you want to go beyond that, you go. <laughs> so I've had the great fortune of coming from a strong uh, background and it's really got me where I am today. So I'm happy. I'm honored to be here to talk about women in leadership positions um, in regards to business, education politics especially, um, and then my passion, sports, right? In my dream world, that's where I'd be. But um, it's a real big honor to talk about that because these are women, these are trailblazers, these are pioneers who have made it possible for me to sit with you, Cindy, today and Lee um, in higher education um, and talk about how wonderful and um, the amazing accomplishments of all of these women. So I hope you guys enjoy this presentation. I'm gonna pull up my slideshow. Um, Give that to you so you don't just have to listen to me rambling on and on. Um, so, so, and of course, it's not on the right page. <laughs> I'm just going to go back at one or two. Okay, so we're going to look at women in leadership today um, business, education, politics, and sports, like I mentioned. Um, here I have a quote from Sarah Alter, who is the president and CEO of the Network of Executive Women. Um, she is, this is a great organization similar to the Lean In Org um, that just really looks for um, promoting women. Okay. And her quote, female leaders have to play a pivotal role in transitioning companies towards the future. I mean, that is the truth. And so, you know, we see in the research and the data, and I won't kind of bore you with all of that, but we have seen where um, the companies that have a great amount of women leadership, um, especially in executive leadership, 20 and 30 percent, they do much better um, in comparison to their um, their rival companies. And so we do need to have women um, playing a role, a big role. Okay? And so we'll kind of look at how these women came about. So we're looking at women in C positions, uh, C-suite positions. What's a C-suite? Um, C-suites are going to be your uh, corporate executive positions. So this is CEOs, COOs, CFOs, CIOs, everybody on the top floor in those suites, okay? Um, and you can see that the numbers are kind of depressing. Uh, only 8% of all C-suite positions are women in the Fortune 500 company, um, which is not a whole lot. So about 41 women CEOs is what it translates to in terms of numbers. Um, for S&P 500, you've got 6% of all C-suite positions and um, about 40 women. It's a little bit better, uh, well, not really better in terms of percentage, but higher numbers anyway for Russell 3000 companies and um, when we're looking there we have about 167 women um, and at least 101 women uh, of those Russell 3000 companies are in charge of very large private uh, companies the stats for the Russell 3000s um, about one in five C-suite leaders are women um, but it's not very good for women of color only one in 25 uh, the CEOs or the C-suite positions are women of color. Um, and that's where we look at the people from um, like Lean In Org and the other organization I was just sharing with you on the first slide are really trying to promote women leadership. Um, how can companies do better? They've set goals, uh, you know, by 20. 
2025 by 2030, what they hope to see and achieve in terms of leadership. And we are seeing it, guys. This is at um, as small as the numbers may seem, they're better. This is higher, you know, compared to 2015, and um, the numbers have really went up. So it's about 4% in the past five years, we've seen an increase in women leadership. Um, and 1% is something, 4% we're doing really good. Okay, um, here is Indra Noye. She is the uh, former Pepsi CEO um, and her quote, don't just stand for the success of other women, insist on it. And really that's what these organizations are doing. That's what I do in my classrooms. Um, my family's always done. Um, anytime there's an opportunity to encourage a woman to take the next step, you, know, you have to insist that they do it. Um, don't just stand by them. You really, we have to push. And, and so that was her quote there. Um, and she was really uh, pivotal because she was the first female CEO of PepsiCo. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, and then here, I love this quote. It's I'm the first outsider CEO at UPS, the first woman CEO, and the first woman CEO in the industry. Lots of glass was broken today. And that's Carol Tomei. Where have we heard that quote before? Lots of glass was broken today. Does anybody remember? Cindy, do you? How, where does that sound familiar from? test question no yeah. i didn't know that i was getting questions ah. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> so know. uh no it's not a test question but when we look, look at the last of glass it was broken today some of you might remember when hillary clinton ran for president um and of course she didn't win and she says you know we didn't break through that glass ceiling but it has a whole lot more cracks right and so lots of glass was broken here and, and i think kind of as we go through um and towards the end you'll really see what i'm talking about um, I don't want to break the glass ceiling, right? We, we, I think we've cracked it enough. We could really punch through it. We, and then have in many ways, um, as you see throughout the uh, presentation, um, I want to break the mold. Like, what, what are you talking about a glass ceiling? We're going to get there, but I want to break the mold. What does it mean? You know, if we're looking at a CEO, why is it so hard? Because the traditional role for CEOs is men, right? And um, especially in terms of business and IT. Um, if you look at other areas like education, it might be more normal to see a woman um philanthropy if you see nonprofits you might see these women and um, that are in these executive leaderships because it's in our nature to nurture this is what we do uh, but in the cutthroat world of business where the ceos are at the top it's men and so we kind of have this idea that that's who belongs there and that's the mold right well we want to break that and we want to break it across everything so not just in business we want to do it in education we want to do it in politics and by god we want to do it in sports right <laughs> we're doing it so that's where we're shooting and we want to break that mold and i think carol tomei would probably agree with me there so who are these women wow um lots of folks um on your screen right now um, there's a ton guys i could spend hours and hours and hours talking about all of the you know trailblazers here um but here on the top left let me see if i can get my cursor for you right here and um, this is susan with jackie i can't say her name properly i'm sorry if i butchered it um she's the youtube ceo and right here next to her Anna Wojcicki, that's her sister, and she is the 23andMe co-founder and CEO. So look at the brilliance in that family, not one, but two women executive officials, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, right here, um, you've got the little microchips. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, this is Lisa Sue, um, and she is the CEO of Adv Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. So what do you think that that has to do with your processors and um, everything computer related? Um, she is at the helm of that corporation. Um, and let's see this one right here to the right. Oh, nope, go back. See, this is why I don't like this. I got to do it in class. <laughs> it's not driving. I know what it is. You're in my way, Cindy. Sorry. So here, okay. Uh, Mary Barra, she is the CEO of General Motors. Um, she is the first woman to head up an automobile uh, corporation, which is pretty amazing, right? This young woman right here is Whitney Wolf, and she she has actually a really interesting story. So she worked with Tinder, um, the app development and all that fun stuff. She had a pivotal role there. She wasn't really satisfied with the direction of her role in the company. And so she went out and founded Bumble, which is now like the number one dating app for women. Um, she was just listed as the you know, huge billionaire. She went uh, public and her app um, hit the, the stock market. So it went to, um, trade and she became a billionaire. So not an overnight sensation, but a very, very uh, intelligent woman. Here, 
we have Lindsay Snyder, who is an heiress. Um, so she didn't found in her own right in and out, but she is the sole granddaughter of the founders. And so she has become the CEO um, and she learned a lot. She had to work the kitchen. Um, so she literally worked every station within in and out to understand how the business worked um, and how customer service was so important. Um, and so she now heads up uh, in and out. This right here probably looks pretty familiar. This is Carly Fiorina and uh, Fiorino, sorry. And she was the CEO of Hewlett Packard. She was also a presidential candidate. Some of you may remember. Um, so she's a, a inspirational woman. She does a lot of pep talks, TED talks, and all of those good things. But um, very important, impressive lady. And then here we have Catherine Graham. I don't know if this person seems familiar to some of you, but she was the CEO of the Washington Post. Um, and she took over as the first woman uh, at that time of the Fortune 500 company. So she kind of super big trail plays are there. I um, mean, you might remember her for her role in bringing down uh, President Nixon and the Watergate scandal. So if you've seen the movie The Post, um, that movie is about her. Okay. Down here in your bottom left, we have Maggie Timoni, who is the uh, Heineken CEO. Beer, beer lady, uh, which is pretty impressive. So she had a number of roles. Um, she worked here in the United States. She worked abroad with the company, um, kind of worked her way up and then ended up in the CEO position. Um, and she really was the first woman in this industry as well. Okay. Um, to the right, we have Ursula Burns, who was the uh, CEO for Xerox, and she was the first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So she's very impressive. So all these women are impressive. I hate to say that, but um, these are pivotal first women, first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company there. Um, and then next to her, we have Safra Katz, and she was the CEO of Oracle. She had a pretty long um history or a road to get there. So she was in investment and banking in her early stages of her career. She went to a managing director role at Lufkin and Jenrett. Uh, eventually, she became a senior vice president. Um, and so at SVP, another one of those uh, positions that we don't see too many women in, uh, about 167, no, I want to kind of back it up, at least about 101 women. Um, are going to be senior vice presidents in that SVP role. Okay. Anyway, so she was the senior vice president uh, before going on to the board of directors in 2001 um, and then president of 2014. She later would then transfer over to Oracle um, and then she became the CEO. Right now, she is regarded as the highest paid CEO uh, in uh, of any American company. So she's doing really well for herself. This young woman on the bottom right is Sonia Chang, um, and she is um, she's an heiress as well um, to the Rosewood Hotel Group. Um, she had to work hard uh, as well whenever she took over. Um, she spent her first two years in the position um, working within the hotel industry. So she looked at how different uh, departments operated. She went from housekeeping to human resources, to operations, to sales, to marketing. I mean, she really went everywhere. And she wanted to learn every single aspect of how the hotel industry worked um, to be able to run it from the top. So she's a quite impressive young woman as well. Yeah. So what about women in politics? Lots of them, huh? <laughs> So these are quite a few first, um, and I'm going to dig into a few more on this slide. So the first member of Congress that was elected is Jeanette Rankin. She was a representative uh, out of Montana. And so her quote here says, I may be the first member of Congress, but I won't be the last. And which also sounds something like Kamala Harris, and which said she was the first vice president uh, woman, or first woman elected to the vice presidency, but she wouldn't be the last. And um, so this is someone who definitely paved the way for women in politics. And um, when we're looking at these guys, these ladies, sorry, I don't want to say guys. Um, Heidi Cataway, she was our first female U.S. Senator. Uh, she was the first woman that was elected to the U.S. Senate, as well as the first woman to serve a uh, chair on the Senate committee. And um, she was elected in 1932, such a long time ago, huh? Um, next to her, you've got Margaret Chase Smith, who was the first woman to serve in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. She was elected as a representative and senator out of Maine. And so she wasn't the first woman, but the first anyway to serve 
chambers. And um, right next to her, you've got Patsy Mink of Hawaii. Um, she's the first Asian Pacific American that was elected to Congress. And um, she is uh, served in the House of Representatives as well. Next to her is Shirley Chisholm of New York, and she's really important. Uh, not only was she the first black female that was elected to Congress in the House of Representatives, she was the first black female major party presidential candidate. So she had quite a bit going on. She was a trailblazer, most definitely. And down below, at your bottom left, is Eilina Ross Layton out of Florida, and she would be the first Hispanic woman that was elected to the United States House of Representatives. Um, next to her is Carol Mosley Braun of Illinois, and she'd be the first woman of color elected to the United States House of Representatives. Um, and then next to her, somebody you probably are all familiar with, at least I hope, and if you're not, you need to come to my government class so that we can learn <laughs> who this person is. This is Nancy Pelosi. Um, she was the first female to be elected as Speaker of the House under George W. Bush um, in 2007, and she served until um, they lost the majority under Obama's administration, and then she regained her seat again, was elected to the speakership once Democrats took over. So she is our current Speaker of the House. And then next to her is Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. Um, she's the first woman of color to be elected to both chambers of Congress. So whereas Margaret Chase Smith was the first woman that served both, uh, Maisie Hirono would be the first to serve, a, a first, woman, first woman of color to serve, All right? So lots of amazing women there from a long time ago, 1932 to current, and who are still working for us. So when we're looking at um, the numbers, how many women do we have in Congress? How many have there been? There's been quite a bit, and I wish I could put every single name up on the screen for you to look at because each one deserves credit. Uh, but we've had uh, 393 women um, that have served in the United States Congress as a member of the House of Representatives, <clears throat> as a delegate, or as a senator. Um, from 1922, to now, to 2021, 58 of those women have served in the United States Senate, and 24 of those 58 are currently serving. So we do have some long-serving women. Uh, currently, Diane Feinstein, Democrat out of California, is the longest-serving member of a uh, longest-serving female senator. Um, she took over a term two years into it, um, and then she has been elected to her fifth full term. So she served a partial term and then um, was elected five subsequent elections. Um, you probably see her quite a bit if you watch any, any type of new C-SPAN. It's fun. I recommend it. Um, Cynthia Loomis. The Republican out of Wyoming is the first uh, newest female, rather newest female member uh, that is serving. So from the, the youngest female to the oldest, we're and not necessarily in terms of age, we don't want to put it like that, but in terms of service. Okay, so those are two important influential women. Um, so from 1916 to 2021, we've had 352 women that have served in the House of Representatives and 121 are currently serving. So we do have a great deal of women in Congress. This is like monumental. We're making big strides. When we look at Congress, um, what I tell my class, like, you know, is it a mirror reflection of society? Does the population of women in terms of representation in either the House or the Senate represent the population as a whole? Um, and it didn't. And now we're making strides we are getting closer and closer to that being a yes. And so we have so many women now that are um, running for election, that are winning these elections, and they're continuing to be reelected. They're doing great things. Um, so clearly, if we have 121 still serving, okay? Um, so that includes 117 representatives and four delegates. And so if you don't know what the delegates are, those are uh, non-voting members of the House that are going to serve our territories and uh, the District of Columbia. Okay, um, when we're looking at the House of Representatives, our longest uh, serving member, a female member is Mary uh, Capture. She is in her 38th term. Wow, long time, right? Um, which is really impressive, but she's the longest serving female member of the House of Representatives. And then next to her would be Nancy Pelosi. Um, we have 27 newly elected women that are serving their first term now. I won't list them all out, um, but that is a pretty big stride right there. That shows you how far we've come from just so few to so many now. 
right. So let's look at a few more influential women in politics. Hopefully you recognize most of these women. Um, the top left are current Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris who was a former senator from California. And I mentioned to you and her comment, you know, saying I'm not the, I might be the first, but I most definitely won't be the last. And so um, we probably remember from election night, a lot of young women, a lot of girls and, and mothers with their children posted pictures on Facebook. I'm um, looking at Kamala, you know, give her acceptance speech and her nomination, of course, in the inauguration um, saying, I can be that woman. And the truth is you can definitely. Um, I tell my students all the time, you, you can do whatever you want to do this. Oh, I want to do this. Or I want to do that. Why not? Let's do it. Come on. I'll help you. Um, but to see some of these young women looking at finally, um, at a woman vice president is just, it's amazing. Okay. Next to her is our, uh, Nikki Haley and, and Nikki Haley is on the top in the middle and down below her is Susanna Martinez. Both of these women are our first female governors. They were both elected to the governorships in the same year. Um, and so we, they're given that distinction. Um, Nikki Haley is the governor of South Carolina. She has a couple of other firsts though. She was the first Indian American to serve a cabinet position and an ambassador to the United Nations under the Trump administration. And um, she was elected at 38 years old, very young woman. Um, and then Susanna Martinez was the first governor of color um, and the governor of New Mexico. So a couple of firsts for her as well. And the top right, we should all know who that is. And that's Hillary Clinton, our former first lady, former U.S. Senator, former Secretary of State. So lots for her. Um, she was the first female presidential candidate um, for a major party ticket. And so she did a great deal. I mean, she's, she's the one who says, you know, she lost her election. We might not have broke through the ceiling, but there's got a whole lot more cracks in it. I mean, it really is true. And I think she's probably very proud. I think we've seen her promoting Kamala Harris and her success and happy she is. The bottom left, we have Condoleezza Rice. And um, you probably remember her from the George W. Bush administration. And um, she was the first black woman to serve as a United States um, national security advisor. And then from there, she went on to be the first black woman to serve as secretary of state. And, and I thought she was excellent. Um, she does a great job even after such as Hillary Clinton uh, traveling around and giving speeches and um, motivating women to reach and go for it. To the right of Susanna Martinez is Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen is now the first female secretary of the treasury under the Biden administration. Um, but she's no stranger to the treasury. She was, um, she served on the chair on the, uh, years before as a committee member. All right, so just kind of a couple of stats here, which are super important. If we're looking at our current administration, we have um, 11 women that have been confirmed to serve under the Biden uh, cabinet. Six have been cabinet level positions, five um, in within the Biden administration. Um, and so he has definitely came out and spoke um, in support of women uh, representation in the executive, and he promised to put women in these high positions, and he's definitely doing that now. Um, 64 women total have held uh, 72 positions in any presidential administrations. So eight women had served in two different spots. So that's kind of why we get a little just the different numbers. So 64 women have held a total of 72 positions um, in presidential administrations, um, which 12 of those, was it 12? Mm -hmm. I think believe it's, we're going to say 12, I'm sure. only 12 presidents have reached out to put women in uh, their administrations. Um, 23 women have sought to become president of the United States. I think all 20 might have or 20 of those 23. <laughs> the last one, we sure did have a field of women, huh? Um, no, but 23 women have sought to become president of the United States. Um, and of course, we know that none have been successful, although, although the time will come soon. Right, it won't be too long. Um, if I had to be a guessing woman, a betting woman, <clears throat> history might tell us 
that Kamala Harris will seek the vice or the presidency again, um, either after a first term Biden administration or a second term administration, depending on how that goes. But um, my guess is that she will be at the top of the Democratic ticket for president nominee. Um, 11 women have sought to become vice president of the United States, but only one. Only one have we seen. This is the first woman vice president, her swearing in, Miss Vice President Kamala Harris. And um, which there was a lot of talk of what is her husband going to be? What are we going to call him? Because we usually refer to the spouse of the um, president and, and vice president as the first lady and the second lady. And so he went with the second gentleman. He's very supportive of her. I want to tell you one thing about these guys. Um, when she was running for president and I don't care where you stand politically. It's, I tell my students this, it's neither here nor there. I want you to pay attention, you know, understand the people who are running for office, what they stand for, you know, do you stand with them? Um, their relationship, her relationship with her husband was to be admired. Um, I remember the day that she dropped out of the race and she just wasn't really doing well. Numbers were falling. And of course, once you start sinking down in, um, and the polls, you start to lose money, right? Nobody wants to give to you and to your campaign. So she decided to bow out. And there was a picture posted on Twitter. It was a black and white photograph. And it's her husband sitting in a chair inside her campaign office. And she's just sitting on her lap, resting her head, just tired, you know, just kind of not really looking defeated, um, but just like, darn. And the clothes says, I got you. Uh, like I always do, you know, and so he really had her back and it was really important because when we see women in leadership positions, be it business or politics or higher education, wherever it is, um, if they're in a relationship, that support is the most important thing ever um, because it's hard to do something so big. And without somebody to stand by you, Cheryl Sandberg of Facebook, um, she wrote about this in her book, Lean In. Um, she needed to be at the table, <clears throat> show up to the table, but that meant that sometimes she had to leave her dinner table. So your spouse, like uh, Vice President Harris, is, needs to be there and participate and help pick up the slack, if you will. Um, so it can't be a one person job. Sometimes it is, but it makes it easier whenever you have that support from your family, from your spouse. Okay. And so in that picture, I always thought I would tell my students, this is what it looks like. This is a woman. She went out, she did her thing. She was running for president. You know, she was fighting the good fight. And at the end of the day, her husband was there all along. He was there and we saw him everywhere with her. And so I think that that's quite admirable. These are my favorites. Who are these women? So I have two dream jobs. One, Supreme Court Justice, yes. And the second, don't laugh, but I would want to be a coach of a Major League Baseball team, right? My husband always said, why are you coaching from the house? Like, I'm always in the couch making all these calls, take the pitcher out, throw a curveball. So in my dream world, Justice, Major League Baseball coach. So these are, these are the five finest women in my eyes here. Sandra Day O'Connor, she's in our top left-hand corner. She sh I hope she looks familiar to you guys. Uh, she was the first woman to serve in the United States Supreme Court, and she uh, was a retired justice. In the middle, right smack dab, is our late RBG, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and she was elected, um, appointed by, it's not elected, but appointed by Clinton. Um, and she served until her death. Um, and then just above her to the right, that is uh, Sonia Sotomayor. She is an associate justice and she was appointed by President Obama. She joined the court in August of 2009. On the bottom left, we have Elena Kagan, who was also a a uh, Obama appointee, so she was appointed by him, and she became an associate justice on August 8th, 2010. So two days, one year later, and um, these two women joined the court. And then on the bottom right, we have our newest associate justice, Amy Coney Barrett, and she was appointed by President Trump, and she joined the court in October of 2020. And of course, uh, you probably remember all of the negative um, attention that she may have received over her appointment, which is politics, how it goes. Um, but ultimately, she received the nomination and is currently serving. So um, of the five, only three are current members of the court.
three women currently. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, it's important to note, she was the first Hispanic woman to serve on my court. So quite impressive. One day you might see Dr. T somewhere there. Okay, so um, let's look at our state government. So we just don't have women in politics at the national level. They're also in the state politics. Um, on your left-hand side um, is Ella Grasso, and um, she was the first woman elected to governor, to serve as governor. Um, and then to your right, we have Madeline Coonan, who was the first woman to serve three terms. Um, what's important to note about women governors, and we kind of go back a while, I don't want to get my dates wrong, so let me just find what page I'm on here. Um, we've had 44 women have been elected to serve as governor in 30 states. Two have served as governor in Puerto Rico and one in Guam. Texas has had two. Um, so, Miriam Ma Ferguson and Ann Richards, the white haired lady, we used to refer to her as, right? So, Ella Grasso um, on the left hand side, she was the first one who was elected on her own right. What do I mean by that? Um, Miriam Ma Ferguson, one of the, the first Texas governor, she was elected governor on the heels of her husband. So many women, when they were elected, it was either uh, basically they were elected after their husbands or husbands died or something like that. And so they would run and carry out essentially their husband's administration, which is what I always would say about Miriam Ma Ferguson. Like she, they called her Ma Ferguson because her husband, um, James Paul Ferguson, uh, was a governor. And so he was ousted and she ran and won the seat. And so I, know, I tell my students, like, she was literally running the executive, you know, he was running it from her skirt, basically. So when I look at Ella Grasso, she was elected on her own right, meaning she did not inherit the seat from her husband um, and she did not inherit it by a constitutional uh, statute or um, secession. So she ran for the office and she won it. There you go. Um, and then, of course, um, on your right hand side, like I mentioned, Madeline Coonan, um, who was the Democrat from Vermont. She is the first and only woman to serve three terms. Um, so she had a great tenure there. So quite impressive. Okay. Um, looking at the state legislators, big first here. There's a lot of these women. Um, currently, we have 2,280 women serving in the state legislators. Which sounds like an impressive number, but when you're looking at 7,000 plus seats that are available and you get 22, a little almost quite 2,300 that are there, um, we're catching up. We're making strides. Um, and, and in Texas, we're doing that as well. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but we have quite a bit of first. So there's 560 women that are currently serving state Senate seats. Uh, 15 have served as president of the Senate or presidents pro tempore, generally like a senior member, um, second in command. You have 1,720 women who are serving in state house or assembly seats. Seven have served as speakers of state houses, which is important. Um, the first three women that were appointed to um, the state legislators, uh, I'll kind of highlight some of these here, uh, but were Clara Cressingham, Carrie Hawley, Francis Clock, and they were elected to the Colorado House of Representatives. Okay. Um, important to note, though, Martha Hughes on the top left there for you. She was the first woman to win a state Senate seat in Utah. And um, so she was the first woman in the U.S. Next to her would be Cora Bell Reynolds. Um, and she's important. She was the first woman of color that was selected to a state legislator. To the right of her, we have Minnie Davenport, which was the first woman to serve as Speaker of the House. And then um, the last on your right is Vesta Roy. And she was the first woman to serve as president of a state Senate. So we look at first, right? And um, not just how many that we have had or most recent ones. We wanna go back to the beginning, who started it all. Um, this is the backs you know, that we are on. These are the women that are carrying us away. These are our trailblazers and have made it possible for these 2,200, 2,300 women to serve in these legislators, okay? It starts with them. And so we need to carry that torch. Uh, when we're looking at the state legislators and, and other prominent positions, this is Kay Bailey Hutchinson, um, and she was the first female senator uh, to represent Texas in the United States Senate. 
Okay. She's a really big, uh, influential woman. She has a huge convention center named after her in Dallas. Typically, if you've made it to a convention center or some type of arena and you're a woman, you did good. Um, but we do have quite a few women that are serving Texas, um, either in the United States Congress, our Texas executive, or the Texas legislator. So we can go through Women's History Month without talking about prominent Texas women, right? Uh, we're super cool. So 10 women have been elected to serve in or serve Texas rather in the United States Congress, um, which includes KB Hutchinson, our US Senator. Uh, Barbara Jordan would have been the first um, female. She's out of Houston. She served um, in Congress as well. Nine have been elected to serve in the House of Representatives. Um, or, yeah, sorry, I was looking at something else, but yes, nine have served in the House of Representatives. Um, nine women have been elected to serve in executive positions within Texas. So we have a kind of a weird executive administration or executive branch structure. So we have our governor and our lieutenant governor, and then we have these other elected executive officials that head up what is our we call our plural executive. And so when I say they've been elected to executive positions, it's one of those. Um, we have the commissioner of agriculture. I don't want to get into my Texas lesson, but um, the general attorney general, um, secretary of state, those people, comptroller, um, but nine have been elected to serve in an elected executive position such as those. Um, three of those women have been elected to two different positions. So Susan Combs, Carol Keaton Strayhorn and Ann Richards. Those three women so served more than one position within the executive branch. So they were really strong. Um, currently, we have one woman serving in the Texas executive, and that's Christy Craddock. Um, she is our railroad commissioner, um, which is in Texas a pretty influential position. Um, although the term railroad commission doesn't quite fit what they actually do. Okay, um, but it is important. Okay. Okay, so on to higher education. Um, this on your right hand side is going to be the first female um, to head up a college. Um, and it was the, her name is Julia Sears. She served as the head of, let me get it right, Mankato, Mankato, Mankato Normal School. Um, typically, when we see normal, we think about teachers, so it'd be kind of fitting. But it is now known as Minnesota, Minnesota State University, Mankato, because she'd be the first woman to serve in that position. Currently, and I, I would not do research on all the institutions because it'd take me forever and a decade, but 39 of the top 200 universities have a female um, in their leadership, okay, at the top level. And 13 universities have a female president. Okay? In Texas, 13 of our 37 public university and systems are led by a female president or chancellor, which is quite impressive. Uh, and you know, our, our public university systems are big, so it's not that we just necessarily have 37, but we have these systems, and at least 13 of those are headed up by a woman. Um, seven of our private institutions are led by female. Um, 27 of our 50 community college districts are led by female president or chancellor. Super impressive. That's a really great number, so we're more than halfway terms of um, community college districts. Our college district, Central Texas College District, is um, headed up by a man, our wonderful Chancellor Yiannopoulos, but right behind him are three wonderful, amazing women. Um, so it's interesting to see, and, and if you kind of look around higher education administration um, at the top, you know, those C-suites, you know, we're looking at uh, these chief positions, executive leadership. There's a lot of men, lots and lots of men. So I don't want to say it's rare, um, but it is not very common to see that many women serving in an executive leadership position. So we, we you can look at it two ways. Chancellor Yiannopoulos is really, really lucky, right? Because he's got these three brilliant women that are helping, you know, guide this ship in the right direction. Or you can feel sorry for him because he has these three really strong-minded women that are telling him what to do. <laughs> so I, I think the first is probably most impressive. Um, but our chancellors, our deputy chancellors, we've got three uh, of our four executive leaders are women, and that is, it's just amazing. So on our left-hand side, if you're not familiar with our administration here at CTC, um, the 
left hand is Dr. Tina Aidey, and she is our Deputy Chancellor of Instruction and Workforce Development. And um, in the middle, we have Dr. Michelle Carter, who is the Deputy Chancellor of Finance and Administration. And on the right, we have Dr. Robin Garrett, who is the Deputy Chancellor for Academic and Student Success. So, what an honor um, for us women to work in this institution with three fine women and our male chancellor as well. We'll give him credit. All right. My favorite. Okay, so women belong in sports. Andrea Hayden says it right there. Okay. Um, this is super impressive. We've seen women making strides, you know, year after year. It hadn't really been a big thing, I don't think. And um in years past, it's like if a woman got a coaching position, she just got the coaching coaching position. But now with social media, I mean, things are different, right? Um, it's all over the place. We can promote them. They're out giving interviews. And um, this is something to look forward to. This is something that we want to promote for our young women. And when I tell you that we're breaking the mold, this is what I meant. You don't have to go and be a teacher if you want to be a baseball player, right? You don't have to. If you want to be a strength and conditioning coach instead of being just a regular PE coach at a public school, go do that. Um, you don't have to be a man anymore to take over these positions. And these women are perfect examples of that. Um, so the top left, we've got Andrea Hayden. And she's that first strength and conditioning coach. And she works for the twins, for the Minnesota twins. And the bottom left is Justine Siegel. And she is our first female coach in the Major League Baseball. So in MLB, she's the first. First of the first. First of the finest. Okay. Um, next to her is Kim Nig. Um, NG, I can't remember how she says her name. So I'm sorry, Kim, for butchering your name. Um, she's the first general manager of the MLB. She was just hired uh, to be the GM for the Florida Marlins. So woo-hoo. What an exciting baseball season do we have coming up. Okay. To the right in the big picture is Rachel Balkovic, and she is the um, first female that was hired as a full-time hitting coach in the Major League Baseball. So these are impressive positions, okay? Um, like I said, the sky's not the limit. We can go beyond there. Here we have um, some coaches in the NBA, uh, which we're starting to see more. One thing I will note to you about the NBA, they have really made impressive strides and efforts to employ more women staff, not just in the front office, but coaching staff. Okay, so about a third of NBA teams have at least one woman on their staff, which is really impressive. Okay, so this top left picture, you've got Natalie um, Nakase, and she is a coach for the Clippers. Um, let's see, what do I want to tell you about her? She's her shirt says it all. I see equality. I love the picture of her. Inspire, love, um, empower, unity. All of these things are reflective of so many movements, um, but definitely a reflection of what women are working towards. Okay. Um, to the right, we have Christy Tolliver, who is a coach uh, for the Wizards. On the bottom left, um, recent phenomenon, you may have seen her in the news, but this is Becky Hammond, and she's an assistant coach for the San Antonio Spurs. She joined Greg Popovich's team um, as a staff member in 2014. She became, just recently, the first female uh, full-time assistant NBA coach in 2015, and she recently coached her first game as a head coach I was her first team but her first game it wasn't on good terms you know papa got thrown out of the game and so he had to hand the ranks over to somebody and he looked at becky and he said you got this no questions asked he totally believed in her um you know there was a lot of hype around it the players was like oh we totally respect her and so what did you think about a woman coaching you know an nba game like we didn't think anything of it. she does it all the time she's our coach we listen to her so it gave you a sense that the players themselves have a great deal of respect for women okay they're not there to try in some instances anyway, hold us back um, and so they're there it's a collective effort to try to raise us up Okay, so she is pretty impressive and and um, you can see her there. I feel like that's what I would look like if I got a job as an MLB coach. Like I'd have that like, oh my gosh, right? Um, in the middle, we have uh, Jenny Butek and she, interesting story, was actually hired by Mark Cuban, pregnant. She was pregnant and he hired her uh, to be a coach for the Dallas Mavericks. So two hometown women, if you say, uh, have female coaches, which is impressive. Now, go Mavs. If I could show you my office, I've got a, a picture over here from the Dallas Mavericks, Mav Maniac. So if I had to pick one of the two, great job, Becky, but go Mavs. 
And then to the right of her um, is a Raptors coach. I just lost her name. Oh my goodness. Raptors coach. <laughs> it's always supposed to be a glitch. God, I can't remember her name. Okay. More impressive, not necessarily more impressive, but um, it might take a special talent, if you will, to coach basketball players. Um, athletes, you know, you have that in you whenever you're, you, it, women have been athletes for a long time. We play volleyball, we play basketball, you know, tennis, softball, whatever it may be. You, you've got that athleticism in you and you've learned the game, you know the sport. And so becoming a coach is almost like second nature, right? Uh, but to own a team is a little bit different, right? Because there's so many components of a professional organization, a professional sports team. And these are four women NBA team owners. Okay. At the top left, um, we have Jeannie Buss. She did inherit her team, the Los Angeles Lakers. She is the only one uh, as a team owner anyway, that can uh, taunt the others as a championship owner. So while well, there might be some other championships, but she has actually has one under her belt. Um, to the right of her is Anne Cronke. She is a, and I hate butchering these names. I think I might be saying it wrong, but she is the owner of the Den Denver Nuggets. On the bottom left is Juliana Holt, hometown team, San Antonio Spurs. Um, she recently, I think, stepped down uh, over the operations, and I believe her son is now taking over, but she's still the owner. Um, and to the right, we have Gail Miller, um, and she is the owner of the Utah Jazz. So quite impressive women heading up these very male-dominant uh, professional sports, and they're doing it. And then we have these women, um, NFL, right? So we've seen a lot of strides lately um, in the news. And so we definitely want to highlight some of these characters. Um, Jennifer King on your top left, um, female coach. She was hired to the Carolina Panthers. Um, doing an awesome job over there. I'm trying to see my middle one's gone. Um, sorry, guys. Cindy, you're blocking my picture again. I got to move you. There we go. I can see Catherine Smith in the middle. Um, she became the first full-time female coach in the NFL when she joined the Buffalo Bills as a special teams quality control coach. So she'd been in the circle for about well, maybe 13 years, and then she finally got a full-time position. So she's quite impressive. And we have Lori Locust from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and uh, we have Marla Javadifir. These two women, top right, bottom left, first female coaches to win a Super Bowl. They were coaches for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the most recent uh, Super Bowl, so they won. Uh, I'm a little sad about it uh, because they beat the Chiefs. I'm not a huge Chiefs fan, but Patrick Mahomes is a Texas boy, so what do you get? Um, but anyway, so those two women, they are assistant coaches, and they um, one of them is assistant strength and conditioning coach, and then Lori Locust is the assistant defensive uh, line coach. So they have pretty respectful positions there. Right. Um, Jennifer King, I don't know if I mentioned this to the top left. She's the first full time uh, offensive assistant. So she uh, does a great job there. In the middle, we have Catherine Smith. Um, she was the first full time coach in the, did I say Catherine? Sorry, not Catherine. Um, Kelly Brownson, getting all my girls mixed up. Uh, she served in an interim position at the beginning uh, for the coach of tight ends um, before moving into uh, chief of staff. And she is currently the highest ranking female coach in the league history. So that's pretty impressive. And then to the right of her, we have uh, Katie Sowers. And she did make some um, news. You might have seen her in the media as well. Um, she joined the San Francisco 49ers in 2019. She was the first female and first um, openly gay coach to appear at the Super Bowl in F NFL history. Um, unfortunately, I think I just read the other day that she's decided not to come back for the next season for 2022. So I don't know if that means she's going to go elsewhere in the NFL or if her time within the NFL is done. But um, super awesome to see her on the field. Right. So coaches, like, you, like I said, you don't have to be a PE coach. You can go out and be an NFL coach, ladies. Let's do it. Okay, and then the officiants. Oh man! So Sarah Thomas, which is pictured on the right-hand side, um, was the first person. She's the first female to break this barrier on the officiating side. 
Um, she was hired in 2015, became the first female official in the NFL. And then she was the first woman official to officiate in the Super Bowl. Um, to her left is Maria Chaka, and she is our first black female official. So now we have these two women officiating in NFL games. I don't want to hear anything about a bad call. We're just going to let it go. <laughs> okay, no, don't go there. Um, and just like with the NBA, we do have some very successful and prominent NFL owners here uh, pictured. So if we look at the top left, we have Amy Adams Strunk, and she is the owner of the Tennessee Titans. Um, her father actually owned them, and so she inherited them from him. <laughs> um, to her right is Gail Benson, and she's the owner of the New Orleans Saints. Go Saints! Ah, Cindy, that's your team. Nola, way to go. Unfortunately, she just lost Drew Brees, so I think she's in the market for a QB, ladies. Anybody? Anybody want to try out? I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> um, on the bottom left, another hometown girl from Texas, Janice McNair. Uh, she is the owner of the Houston Texans. Um, she did take over after her husband's passing, uh, but she's doing a great job leading that organization. I think some people might disagree with me. Uh, we did lose some prominent players, though. So McNair, she's got a lot to do in terms of replacing JJ Watt. Oh, heart 99. And um, next to her, Jody Allen. Um, she's the owner of the Seattle Seahawks. And then next to her is Sheila Ford Hamp, who is the owner of the Detroit Lions. Now, these are five, uh, rather six women that own teams as individuals okay there are other two other women who own alongside their husbands and so they're there but they do own um with their spouse and that's um d haslam and kim pagula so they are owners with their husbands for the um cleveland browns and the buffalo bills hockey is not just football and baseball and basketball and the hockey league women are starting to crack the ice Right, forget the glass ceiling, but they're cracking the eyes. Um, and so on the left hand side, we have Dawn Braid, and um, she was hired as a coach for the Arizona Coyotes. And on the right, we have uh, Valerie Camilo, who was hired as president of the Philadelphia Flyers. So, pretty important positions, although, go stars, Dallas stars. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some women in the front office or on the coaching staff there. So, um but that's all I have for you today. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, we'll take some questions. But I do want to just kind of say one more thing again. When we're looking at women in these leadership roles, I hope in my rambling on of my list of so many important women, what you gathered is the traditional roles for women. Um, cracking the glass ceiling. Ladies, that's not what we're doing. We're breaking the mold. We have broke the mold. Um, and we just need to just break it all the way through. We need to shatter it. We need to crumble it. We need to go out there um, and fight for these positions and, and what we want to do. So any questions? Any, any questions right now? Uh, there's none at this time. Well, I, I love the fact that you keep saying that you need to crack the mold. I, you know, when you keep hearing things like um, that, they're, they're breaking the glass ceiling. I've always thought, well, why is the ceiling still forming above? Why do we have to keep breaking it? Can't we just get rid of it? Totally. So, what would be, yeah. What would be your. Like advice to young women um, in any of these fields on, so um, getting it, you know, keep going. I think I would probably tell them what I was told. Um, first of all, like you have to sit at the table. Cheryl, and I, I was told this long before I ever knew who Cheryl Sandberg was, before she was a thing on TED Talks. Um, I mentioned my department chair, and when I tell you she was like four foot nine, I mean, she's little, but gosh, she was mighty and she was strong. And, and so she talked about her struggles coming up when she was uh, the only woman in her class, you know, when she was getting her doctorate. And she kept telling me, you know, they would just kind of push her around when they talked about research or theories. And they would just kind of like, she would try to put her two cents in and give her opinion. They would just, you know, oh yeah, that sounds great, but like go make some cookies or something. Um, and it was really frustrating. And so finally she told me in a not so very nice way, but basically she said, I had to take my seat at the table. And she really went with this, passion that said 
just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I can't do it. Doesn't mean I don't know it. Um, I will and do it better than you. Right. So the advice that she gave me literally is don't be afraid to take your seat. And then Sheryl Sandberg comes in and says the same exact thing. And so the first thing that you have to do when you're truly passionate about something, I think it's easy for you to take the seat, right? I can sit down, but will I speak up? And am I going to do the work that I need to do to prove myself? And in order to do that, I mentioned having that support from your spouse, from your family, um, you have to have that. And so the other advice is if you haven't, chosen a partner yet in life um, and you're working towards that, choose a partner, okay? And, and it really has to be someone who is going to, to be your partner, who's going to pick up the slack, who's going to help you and who's going to understand and, and then not hold you back. Um, I am a super, I'm not going to say difficult, uh, but I'm a, I'm a strong-willed woman, okay? And it, uh -huh. it's, it's the culture. <laughs> My poor husband, I, he's not watching right now because he's in Japan, so it's okay for me to say this. He won't hear it. Um, it's horrible, but, by the way. Yeah. So um, I chose a good partner for me, right? It, it, was a, it was a learning curve, I think, at the beginning because I had so much going on um, in terms of, you know, my obligations for studying and being a mom and being a wife. Um, and, and his said you're a mom first everything else comes second to that you know but he finally you know and it didn't take him long to realize to say okay well you don't have to be a mom first you can be a student first you can be a professor first you know it takes a lot of work to do that and so he stepped up and he was dad first whenever i needed him to be dad first um even if that meant putting our relationship to the side sometimes and so my advice is take the seat don't sit there you know, you have to speak up and when you're in your life course, choose a partner. Um, if you're and if hopefully you're at that point now um, where you, you, you know that you have that partner who's there to help you along. Um, and so those are probably the biggest advice that I would give to women. Don't be afraid. You can do this, right? It's your passion. Why not? It's not, can I? It's why don't you, right? Um, and so that'd probably and be the big will I. And yeah, definitely. Is, and, and I'm going to definitely hold people to it. Like if you say, oh, I want to go to school. Don't say that to me. Oh, really? Let's, let's get you registered right now. So let's move this along. You know, I want to and, and promote women um, and, and build other women up too, right? Don't just do it for yourself. You want to do it for other women. You want to set the example for your children, um, you know, for your nieces, for your nephews, for whoever in life. And um, we have to build each other up which I think is really important. And then I'm so fortunate and maybe people don't have it the way that I do. Um, and those people are probably stronger fighters than me. Um, I didn't have to fight too hard because I had the best support system. Uh, you know, my, my family, uh, my, my daughter who understood sometimes whenever I had to go do something and I couldn't be at her whole entire dance competition. I literally could walk in, watch her dance and then leave right? Or get to the football game for halftime and leave. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's important. And I was very fortunate to have those, those women in my court. That's great. I mean, you definitely are a role model to everyone who is listening today. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not just talking women, I'm talking men, I'm talking our community, because they see that 50% uh, or a little more than 50% of our population is female. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah. we, we, we are coming. Yeah. <laughs> we are coming for representation and, and not giving up. And that's what we keep, you know, we have to do is, is as you did, just keep going in your yeah. life. And so. there's so many around, like, and even in CTC, you know, I look at, um, and it's hard to compare our campus, I guess, to many others, but um, because I feel like we're just kind of a family here. I mean, we have seven deans that are women. We have... One of them is right next door to me. My dean of Fort Hood is a woman. You know, how amazing is it to get to work for someone, a woman in a leadership position that does help build up? I mean, every day, you know, she's there doing the work and she you know, has a daughter, she's doing it, right? Um, and it's inspiration to all of us. And it, how can I not inspire to be something like that? Three associate deans that are women. So we look at campus leadership across the board. Um, it's around. You got to just look and open your eyes and say, it's not normal. I will tell you that. It's like I said, it's not uncommon, but it is not that common to see so many women in these leadership positions and, and they're doing a great job. 
Well, and, and we are fortunate here and we are, um, we were fortunate to have you come today Thank you. and you were talking about, you know, breaking through when we started this, she was like, okay, I'm really nervous and I've never done this before. And I don't think I, I you know, I'm having, and it's like, look how great you did. Your mama <laughs> watched it and was proud of you. No, my, yeah, hopefully my, my mom's going to say, well, you messed up here and there. I was surprised she didn't ask any questions. So I was have to tell her to go make my lunch. <laughs> oh, well, maybe Lee's just not giving you those questions. No, anymore. I'm just kidding. No, she's awesome. Yeah. I, I, if, if only my mama tuned in today, that was the best part of my day. So awesome. now I really was nervous just because I'm a people person. I like the interaction. Um, I can't see who's on the other side of the screen. Um, and I want you know, that genuine, authentic connection with folks. And so that's what makes it a little bit difficult to do these virtual things. Well, I want to high five all the women. Yes, yes. And, yeah, and so high five to everybody watching. Yeah, and, and everyone put in a comment, put in a comment so that Dr. Temple knows you're there. Yeah. Because I know we know that they're there. And yeah, um, so we want to thank you so much. You, you. This is the second time we've had you. The first time was in person. And mm -hmm. um, you you just do an amazing job. So, so guys, today you're lucky. This is our expert on yeah. women's history month <laughs> and we hope that you will come back again um next time maybe it'll be in person but yeah. we're gonna <laughs> always from this point on stream yeah. our yeah. in-person events so that we still have all of our global students with us yeah so. um well lee if we've got no other questions we're gonna go ahead and take us out we have no more virtual events this week. <laughs> that was the last but, of it. But no, 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 no. But next week we start again with two more women's history speakers. And uh, we will be starting. Wow, I don't have that on. <laughs> Go to our events website. You were talking about not being able to remember people. Um, and we'll put we'll post it also as well. So two more women's history speakers next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Temple. And um you just keep going fighting for women. I Thank feel you. much better knowing that you're up there in the front fighting for everyone. Thank so, you. Thank you for hosting right. this for us, Cynthia. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I love this. I love this. It you're such a great organizer. You always get the good events going. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Well, Bye. Lee, take us out. Bye, guys. <laughs>